Good evening. No, not bad. All right. So, uh, good evening once again. I'm Gary. And uh, before we officially start, can we just give Angela and Emily a big round of applause for putting together this wonderful event? <laughs> and I say this because uh, even though I'm a speaker, I've been doing this for the last 10 years. I did venture into events. I know how painful it is to actually put together big events, successful events, and they have been doing this for the last. 12 installations, so it's huge work, and many times the organizers don't always get the recognition uh, for all the hard work that they put in. So one of the things that I always make a point to do is to recognize the efforts that I've been uh, doing. Um, so as uh, Angela mentioned earlier, I've been doing this for the last 10 years. I am a speaker. I, uh, these are the two companies that I first built, started with, and more recently I've uh, ventured into other businesses that are still in construction, and literally there's one new one coming along the way, literally in construction. And that is in my family business, right? Uh, my dad is 74 years old, so he really wants to retire. And because he's been doing this for the last 30 years, he's getting really tired. And he said, you are either going to take it over or I'm going to close it down. And he's been doing this for the last 30 years. So I said, you know what, since I've been doing this for a while, I'm the only person who uh, has some sort of business experience. And I said, yeah, why don't we go for another adventure, right? I do not know how that's going to turn out, but hopefully we'll have another story to tell in the future. Uh, these things that are here just makes me look a little bit more important than I really am. Uh, <laughs> but really, it was just some of the uh, nice milestones that uh, recognition that came about in this journey over the last uh, 12 years or so. All right, and I look forward to sharing with you some of these experiences. All right, uh, I went to a party recently. And one of my friends said, hey, Gary, you know how are you still a motivational speaker? Which is weird because I've never considered myself as a motivational speaker. All right? For a very simple reason. Only when you think about Nike, what comes to mind? Just, just do it. All right? Can you just turn to your neighbor and say, just do it? Oh, you're very obedient, huh? all Singaporeans, right? <laughs> then you reply to your neighbor and say, do what? <laughs> so when I was starting out my career, I was thinking, uh, I don't want to go down that path where I'm just another motivational speaker sharing ideas, uh, things that don't, may not always work, like what Angela mentioned about theory and practicality. So I said, you know what? I've always been interested in teaching. Uh, I've always been interested in business. So why don't I marry the both of them and uh, see whether I can make it work? But I wanted to give it a short fist. So when I first started in 2006, officially as a trainer, I was working for other people and we worked with kids. Um, and this was a leadership program, and it went pretty well. So I said, maybe there's a potential for me to go further. Uh, I started writing blogs about communication, public speaking, and for one reason or another, it took off. Right? People from different parts of the world coming in and saying, you know, we love your work. Uh, can we use it in our books? Can we do this, do that with the material, the content that you have? I said, wow, wonderful. So I thought I was onto something, and I said, okay, go by all means, and maybe we can start a business around it. Uh, so we started our venture in 2008 with Speak Ventures, with communication. Uh, we started with schools again, the schools loved it. Uh, we went even to primary schools, teaching the kids how to present themselves, influence, sell themselves. And I went up uh, a little bit further in the journey. Uh, we went to JCs, the polys, we took part in competitions uh, and really kicked ass, right? We won the competitions a couple of, time, a couple of times. And after a while, I got too expensive, and they said, Gary, thank you very much. Right? Three quotes, you're too expensive, bye-bye. Uh, which was okay, because subsequent years, they all lost. All right? uh, but the, the biggest milestone came when, uh, shortly after I graduated from NUS, uh, my professor came through and said, Gary, you know, we know what you're doing. We know you're not going to uh, continue your, uh, your work in the real estate industry. I studied real estate. and said, but I have students uh, my PhD students who really need help in their communication skills, can you come in and help? And in return, you'll be a lecturer of, two of NUS, which sounded pretty cool because I, all I had was a bachelor's degree. And I was teaching uh, postgraduate students, the PhD students. So I thought, yeah. Which was great because my brother had a PhD and I could one up over him, right? Said, so, yeah, in your face. But what, went, uh, even, what was even more outstanding was uh, shortly after, about the same time, I was headhunted. And from schools to university and onto corporate, um, things went pretty well. And I was headhunted. I worked, started working with corporate leaders in HP, Google. It was wonderful. And it was supposed to be a short-term stint, just give me some corporate experience. 
but I stayed for two years. Um, they promoted me, and shortly after they promoted me, I got bored. And I said, thank you very much. I want to come back to business. And that is where um, the fun began, right? This was one of the final pictures we took in one of the trainings. When I came back into the business, uh, this is where we fucked up, right? When we came back into the business, I said, you know, I've been away from the business for two years. It's about time to come back, re-immerse myself. Uh, let's have a party. Let's organize an event where we will have 400 people come together and we will talk about entrepreneurship business development. All right. I left the business in, I left my corporate job in, um, I think, July. No, sorry, in, in July. And I said, yeah, I think we can put together a, a, an event in about six months. So I plan to leave in March. I left in July. And I think in September, we put together an event. Now, I gathered a number of uh, partners together, and we said, you know what? You guys are going to do this. You're going to help me promote the event, and I'm going to put together the speakers lineup, right? Um, what I didn't realize was, as I was trying to put together the entire event, and everybody was saying that I'll bring in 100 people, I'll bring in 100 people, I'll bring in 100 people. By the end of um, the event, or rather, towards the, towards the actual event, I realized that there was only one partner that actually brought in the numbers. But I had promised people, and I was marketing the event as one that had 400 people. So I had one more month left to scramble and put together the numbers. If not, it would look entirely terrible on my credibility, especially when I said that I'm going to promise 400 people there. So I was scrambling, I was running around, I was going to networking events, I was speaking to network owners, and I said, you know what, I have this event coming up. Uh, would you like to promote it on my behalf? But I had nothing to give them. And by the grace of God, really, one way or another, uh, I found another partner, which we eventually became close friends with, and said, Gary, we like you, and, right, and for you, we will do a publicity, uh, we will run the publicity for you for free. And one week before the event took place, I had another 200 people who signed up just by this partner, which was amazing. The final uh, enrollment for this event was 500. And we had about 383 people who attended that one day event, which was a huge reliever for me, right? And one thing it taught me was uh, you need to really get hold of the real partners, uh, committed partners on, for your event in order for things to go well. So I said, you know, that was an adventure. I've learned my lesson. Tell you what, let's do it again. So we ran another event, uh, slightly smaller scale because I learned my lesson, supposedly. And said, so I said, okay, we're going to have an event for 300 people, and this time you're going to run it at Suntec City, right? Uh, but I realized, guess what? The same thing happened again. <laughs> what happened at the event was uh, there were lots of things. We, we wanted to run something in March, and because of the holidays, because of uh, Chinese New Year, and one of the uh, repeated lessons that came up was being a trainer and being a speaker, running events was something that I had some experience in, but marketing, marketing it, promoting it, uh, wasn't exactly something that I was really particularly strong in. So even though I was able to promote it, I didn't have the necessary muscle and the resources to go full out to really rally as many people as possible by my own effort. So as we were pushing it, as we were drawing near to the event, um, the same things happened again. And that was the inability to reach as many people as we wanted to. And one more thing happened in March 2016 or 2015, which really uh, challenged or changed the landscape or was totally out, out of our expectations. What happened in March 2015? Somebody passed away. And the entire mood of the country just crashed, right? Nobody wanted to sign up for anything. Uh, the entire headlines was dominated by um, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew passing away. And even for Suntec City, which we are supposed to promote the event with their big screens after their refurbished and meeting places, the entire big screens where the roads, where the cars would pass by, see it and say, you know, this is a great event, the entire screen behind and in front and behind the buildings were dominated by this picture. So once again, I realized that the ability to market and promote the event was entirely crushed and compromised because of events that were out of control. And more importantly, beyond this, it was my inability to get hold of partners who could really also promote the event on our behalf. 
And so one of the things that happened uh, was I felt entirely defeated and broken. Imagine uh, having gone through about eight years of steady climbs, uh, victories, and it was just these two events shortly after I came back into the business that totally flopped. That made me wonder, you know, am I really suited in the business? Did I, where did I fuck up, right? So brokenness became something that was really dominating uh, the mindset in my mind at the, at the point in time, and I was totally lost, literally. I was wondering, you know, am I still suited in my business? Should I go back to work? And one of the things I realized that having gone through so many things, or so many experiences, I began to wonder, you know, am I really suited to be an entrepreneur? Am I just a speaker? Because you know, I've worked with small business owners, I've worked with corporate leaders, we did make a lot of money together. You know, whether it's for myself or whether it's for Google, HP, or whatnot. Um, I realized that I've been going through my life over the last eight years with so much focus on pr promoting an idea of success and what it mean, meant to be successful that every time we went somewhere, it was all about, you know, how are you doing? How do you make more money? Yeah, this is great. You know, I'm doing fine. I'm wonderful. I'm better, than, I'm better than great. You know what? I can help you become even more successful. And that was a conversation I had uh, with lots of people in the business because I think in entrepreneurship, we always had to present an image of success and, uh, I don't know, getting our shit together. And after a while, and this was an episode that really challenged that idea that am I really who I was? And I vividly recalled this moment when I went for a networking event and I met an ex-colleague there who also started a business. And I said, you know, how are you? So I did ask the question, how are you? All right. And I said, what, so what are you doing right now? So that was congruent. And she said, yeah, I, things are fine. And I asked, so what is, what's new with your work? What are you working on right now? And then she just stopped me, right? And she said, Gary, today we are, no, we are just having drinks with friends. Can you stop talking about work? So I said, sure, fine, no problem. Then talk about what? <laughs> and then it struck me, right? Damn, I had no idea. I had no, nothing else to talk about besides work because my entire life was consumed by work. I, I, I forgot how to have fun anymore. Every time I met somebody, I was talking about work. And I was exhausted. I didn't know how to feel anymore. I was, and after feeling, I was just anxious and angry with lots of different things. In a nutshell, when I tell my friends this story, it could be easily summarized by the first, by the first letter of every word. I literally felt dead. I didn't know how to feel anymore. I didn't know who I was. And all I could think about was work. Yeah. Uh, so that was a major wake-up call I worked, uh, for Andrea as well. I, did, did, I needed to decide and think about you know, what are some of the things that really define myself. I needed to discover who I was again and what really defined me. And that really sparked a, a, a period of soul-searching. Right? Was there more to my life than work? Or if I were working or running a business, what exactly were the things that I was chasing? All right. Was there more to work than just earning money? Is it just career? Is it family? Or was it relationships? So I did a whole lot of whole, uh, soul searching. I realized I was so focused on the goal that I missed the big picture. All right. And I started asking myself again, why are you a trainer? Why are you in business? What, is, what are your core values? What are the things that really define you? What were your core strengths, right? I began to focus more on uh, speaking to people again, to understand who and what they stood for and what was important on them. I began to listen more. Rather than speaking, sharing ideas, I began to listen what were the pain points and what were the concerns were. I began to speak less as a speaker and listen more as a friend, as a confidante. And things just started flowing again because as people shared with me their concerns uh, and the issues and the challenges that they face in business, whether in corporate or as a small business, I began to feel and empathize what were some of the challenges they were going through. And as we did that, uh, we met wonderful people, we spoke, we shared ideas. I began to share some of the lessons that I took away. And the amazing thing was, as some of my students took some of these lessons, they began to apply it themselves all right, and began networking with their own VIPs, right? And I started to have a sense and feel that, hey, maybe, I'm not as washed out as I was, and maybe there's still some value in what I was doing. I began going back to some of my ex-colleagues uh, and said, you know, is there something we can do? What are some of the 
uh, other areas that can be of service to. And we started seeing results with them. And more importantly, as I began training, coaching again, focusing on my core business, I began to have fun again. All right. So we went for networking events, and I remembered one of the challenges that some of my friends and some of the people we met um, when they were sharing, that meeting people that they could work with were some of the challenges. And, I, and it resonated with me because that was also some of the things that uh, I stumbled upon or I stumbled over when I was running my own events. So I said, you know, when it comes to running events, are we doing it just for the sake of money or is there something more that we can do? So be, with some of my friends, I began working and running events as well, going for events, and we started building a network of authentic business leaders, authentic community, where people with uh, similar values and you know, willing to invest with each other started to come together. <coughs> oh, we did this a couple of times. And one thing is we realized that even though our meetings took about two hours, we had more and more people staying be, uh, beyond the event, which was great because this wasn't something that initially happened. So we thought there was again, some, you know, we were onto something. But having said all these things, uh, the partnerships that we had when we first started in 2014, uh, after, the, after stumbling over the events, we started to focus on being small again rather than being big and focus on looking at areas in which we can really complement each other. Because even though we could run those events by ourselves, I realized that it took a huge amount of energy from me. I couldn't do it by myself anymore. And rather than trying to exert and hit the massive numbers again, there was a magic, uh, there was magic in just being small again. Uh, so I just wanted to close with one, one quick story. Um, in view of all the things that has happened, was uh, there's this guy, or there were four people at the hospital, and they met each other at the hospital because their wives were delivering at the hospital. All right. So the first guy was, uh, was waiting really impatiently, and the nurse came out and said, congratulations, sir. All right. You have twins. And he said, oh, wow, what a coincidence. All right. I work at uh, the Twin Towers in KL. All right. And then the nurse came out again, and she went to the second guy, and she said, hey, congratulations, sir, you have triplets. I was like, wow, that's wonderful. What a coincidence. I work at 3M. OK. And then the third guy, and the third nurse came out again, right? And she said, congratulations, sir, to the, to the third guy. Said, you have quadruplets. And he said, wow, what a coincidence. I work at Four Seasons. And then when the nurse came out and she met the fourth guy, everybody saw him banging his head against the wall. And everybody was wondering why. And he said, it's terrible. I work at 7-Eleven. <laughs> so in the spirit of coincidences, you know that in life we sometimes feel that there are lots of coincidences in our lives. Um, but I truly feel in view of all these things that we have done, uh, I don't feel that these things happen by accident. Uh, I think it was a major wake-up call, which I'm grateful for, because at one moment in my life, I felt dead, exhausted, and totally angry. And I lost a lot of money, uh, almost to the point of being broke. Yet, because I lost that, it truly got me to reflect and find myself again. All right? And know what I care about, to focus on the things that really made me happy, seeing people grow, uh, supporting businesses. So. I think one of the major points I'd like to share with you uh, is just to focus on the major, major on the major, and always remember to make the main thing the main thing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Oh, okay. okay. Teaching and business, yeah. and on business. Um, I've always wanted to teach, so I went to one of my teachers, who I really looked up to, and I said, sir, you know, I'm thinking of becoming a teacher, so would you give me some advice? Uh, because I was looking for a degree then. I was about to start my, uh, my degree in NUS. So he said, Gary, have you signed anything yet? I said, not yet. I haven't done anything at MOE yet. So he looked straight at me in the eye, and he said, Gary, do not do it. So my teacher said, do not do it. 
So I was curious, um, but he shared with me that even as a teacher in Singapore, more than 70% of the time, you will not be teaching. You'll be doing administration, you'll be organizing events. So I said, you know, go out there and get a job. If you really feel that your heart is, is in teaching, um, then come back, right? Uh, and with industry experience, MOE would really, uh, don't quote me, treasure you even more with your industry experience. I knew as well that I hate to work, and not as an employee, because uh, serving national service, I was working with the police force, going to the same cubicle in my office every day was fun for the first three, for the first three months, but for the rest of the year, it just took everything out of me. So I knew that being an employee and having the same routine every day would be really challenging. I said that I will start something. And when the point came for me to make a decision, and I knew that I had something to offer, I said, you know what? We're going to register a business. Um, we're going to market ourselves. We're going to reach out to some schools and see whether they bite. And one thing led to another, and we just took off. Yeah. So we did well enough to deliver value. Um, people saw they were delivering results, and we just sold each result to another school. Yeah. And word of mouth, word and referrals came out, and yeah, we, we managed to build something after four years. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Construction? In this, I'm glad that you asked this question because uh, going to construction is something that I am I struggled with for a very long time. I've, okay, let me be honest. I have no interest in construction. Um, uh, my family business is in uh, civil civil engineering, so we lay roads, pipes, uh, boardwalks. Yeah, and the property the property development industry isn't doing well in Singapore. Uh, but yet, in the spirit of authenticity and knowing what my core strengths are, my core strengths aren't in construction, administration. I can do some organization, but I know what I'm not good at. So going to something that I'm entirely unfamiliar with, knowing this, uh, going through this journey, I know that I can't do it that way. But I know one thing that I'm good at. I know one thing, and that is in mentoring, in coaching, in helping people find their strengths and really do well in their areas. So working with people, I could see what they are great at, what they are strong at, in, even in areas that they're they not aware of. So if I can employ somebody, for example, and help them shine, that has been something that has been proven over the last 10 years. And I said, you know what, if I'm going to come into the construction industry, I will apply what I've done in training. I'll use what strengths I have to help them grow, and they will run the business. So that's one. The second thing was, uh, in terms of priority, family. Lah. I spent 10 years chasing my career and I lost everything, almost everything. I said, uh, and really it was hard to relate to people, I said, okay, I'm going to focus on something that's more tangible now, uh, and that is to honor my dad, who has been serving the family for 30 years. Uh, in 74, I think that's an urgent priority. Uh, I, I've spent 10 years in the marketplace doing what I want, I think now I can come back and serve him. Yeah. Career, I will, will have a little bit more time to work on that as we go along. Yeah. Yeah. I think ultimately, just to quickly answer that question also, and also what Angela mentioned, uh, Andrea, Andrea mentioned earlier, is what gives you peace? Even though you struggle in business and you wake up and you say, is this something that I still want to do? Say, so, yeah, I still love to see people grow and I love to help people, uh, help people develop and chase their dreams. So if this is my dad's wish to retire, I think I can honor him and I'll still have the peace to go so, even though it's a struggle for me. I think I'll have a great piece to do it with him or for him. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Mm. Great. So anybody who says yes too quickly to me, I get scared. So I run a networking event. So this is this is my test, right? If you come for the event once and you don't come for it ever again, you're not going to be a partner. Because there's no consistency and congruence. It's not enough time for me to really get to see whether your heart is in something. 
But if you're willing to invest time, effort, and even your expertise to grow something, what I'll do is I really go out of my way to help you connect and uh, help you find referrals. And one of the best things is um, I have one student that came to me. Actually, he's here. He's sick, but he's here. Oh, he's there. He's a little bit sick, right? He is crispy. He came. He started his business last year, and uh, that was towards the end of my own journey. And but he has always been trying to give support the business as much as possible. So I realized that. He took his own time, his own expertise to come support what I was doing. And one challenge that he was going through was as a new business owner, he couldn't uh, connect with people as much or sell as well because he was always focused on the product rather than building a relationship. So I saw he was doing great work. He was really sincere. He was spending time and his own effort to um, come for the events, but he didn't know how to. So I saw the character. I saw the commitment. I said, I can give you the competence. All right. And it became the same for uh, all the other partners. Are you focused on helping the community? Are you hope, focused on giving first? Because once the character and commitment is there, I think the rest should be much easier. As compared to a person who is competent, but doesn't commit to growing the business together. So I think time is important. Congruence, congruence and consistency is important. And we need to test it out a little bit. Great question. Yep. Do you have any questions? Any other questions? <laughs>